camera angles are an extremely important part of prompting for photos in AI. If you ever felt like there was an image you could picture in your mind, but you couldn't quite put it into words, it's probably a good idea to get started by using the camera angle or the camera shot. So in today's workshop, we're going to cover everything you need to know about different camera angles in AI prompting. When it comes to prompting in mid-journey, there's two main questions you have to ask yourself. The first question is, what are you seeing? The subject, the environment, the colors, the shapes, the big general ideas. The second question is, how are you seeing it? This can come down to the camera angles, which we'll cover in today's lecture, or it can come down to the lighting or any filters you have on your image. We'll learn about six different aspects. Number one is the direction of the subject. Number two is the camera shot and framing that subject in that camera shot. Number three is the camera angle we're seeing the subject from. We'll also cover the camera lens, which is like a filter you can apply to the image, discuss some framing techniques, and then finish off with using different camera angles for landscape photos. The subject direction, you can think of it like if you were taking a photo of someone and you walked around them in a circle and took a bunch of different photos, what direction would they be facing? So if they're facing straight on right at you, that's the most basic centered view or the front shot. If you go 90 degrees to the side, that's a side profile. And the side profile highlights the silhouette of their face much more. You can see the structure of the nose, the lips, and the chin. The three quarter view rotates the front view about 45 degrees. And it's probably the most common default mid-journey camera angle, which means that if you just prompt a mid-journey for a photo of someone, this is probably the angle that you're going to get. We can also go behind the subject and take a back view shot or a back three quarter shot, which is where they're still facing away from us, but their head's slightly tilted. So we can see some details on their face. An effective keyword to use is looking over the shoulder. This one is where they're facing away from us, but the head is turned, like a three-quarter shot or a quarter shot. So we've covered all the different directions that someone could be facing, whether they're facing towards us or if they're turned away from us, but their head's pointed in different directions. I just want to stay on the back view a little bit more. I really like this one. If you ever played any video games or anything like that, this is the viewpoint that you're going to get. It makes you feel like the subject's more relatable and you can see what they're seeing. And there's also some added mystery because you don't see their facial features and you kind of wonder what they look like. Next up is the camera shot. So the camera shot, think of it as emphasizing what parts of the subject you want to focus on uh, or also the distance and how far away you are from the subject you're taking a photograph of. So in this instance of this bronze statue, we're taking a long shot, so we're really, really far away. It makes the subject look tiny compared to the environment. In contrast, we could get really close and personal and just focus on one tiny aspect of the statue. So here, we took an extreme close-up shot of that statue's eyes. Now, when it comes to camera shots in mid-journey, there are some common photography terms you can use, like the close-up shot on the face, the medium shot, which frames a subject from the chest or waist up, or the full body shot, which should theoretically take a photo of the entire body. However, if you notice in these photos, that doesn't really work super well. That's why I put the orange question marks there, because in the full body shot, you can see that it doesn't actually show any of the subject's lower body. To deal with this, we have to use some prompting techniques. So the absolute best way to frame your subjects in mid-journey is to include in the prompts exactly what you want to be inside the image. So for the medium shot, I specifically asked for a sword to be on the statue's waist. And so because I added that in, mid-journey will include everything from the waist up. The full body shot is a bit trickier. So in the photo in the middle, uh, I asked for the statue's feet to be inside the image. But as you can see, if I did that, then it only includes the close-up shot of the statue's feet and leaves out any of the upper body. When you want to prompt for a full body shot, especially in a wider aspect ratio image, you have to include details of the head and also details of the feet to include the entire body inside the image. 
let's see another example. I'll do a volleyball player this time and slowly adding more and more of her body into the shot. So in the first prompt, I'm going to include that she has a ponytail and this will make sure that her head is going to be inside all of the photos. Next up, I added in that she's wearing black knee pads and you can see the photos taken from the knees up. And in the final photo, I added in the fact that she has white volleyball shoes. So now we can see everything from the ponytail all the way down to the volleyball shoes. So this is the most effective way to frame your subjects. Don't try to just go with a photography term like medium shot or full body shot. That's not going to work that well. Another effective way to prompt for full body shots is to change up the aspect ratio. So the aspect ratio makes a big difference in the type of photo Midjourney will generate by default. For wider aspect ratios, it likes to focus on the head in close-up shots. If you use a vertical aspect ratio, it tends to generate the full body or include much more of the body inside the image. So here, I only included that they're wearing shoes. I didn't include any details about their head, but it still renders the entire body. We can pull the camera all the way back and get a long shot. In this one, the subject is framed relative to the rest of the environment. So we can see the scale of everything that's around them. And it's a great way of building the world around the person. One good tip for long shots is to use a wider aspect ratio. Here I used a two to one aspect ratio, but you could use like a three to one aspect ratio for extra cinematic photos. Let's do a quick review. So we've covered the direction that the subject is facing and also how to frame the subject in the camera shot. For the camera angles, it's kind of like the direction that the subject is facing. So I talked about how for the subject direction, you're walking in a circle around them and taking photos while you're walking along that circle. For the camera angle, imagine that the subject is inside of a big sphere and, and you're taking photos of them at different points on the sphere. One of the basic ones would be a high angle shot where you're shooting them from above. So the camera's pointing down. It, this typically makes them look smaller, weaker, and puts you in a position of power. The opposite end would be a low angle shot where you're below the subject and tilting the camera upwards. This will make the subject look bigger, stronger, more powerful like they're in charge and make you feel smaller. One key term to include for high angle and low angle shots is that you want to either say that you're above the subject or below the subject. So in the image on the left, I just included a low angle shot of the helicopter. And as you can see, it doesn't work for every image. We're just looking at the helicopter straight on. But in the photo on the right, I included low angle shot from below. And that way, Midjourney knows that we have to be below the helicopter and pointing upwards. Here's an example for high angle shots. We want to make sure that we include we're taking a high angle shot from above to make sure that we get the exact photo we want. Wide angle shots will pull the camera back a bit more and showcase more of the surrounding environment. So here I included in the prompt that it's raining and that there's a crowded street and we can see much more of the street from this photo. One thing about prompting in Midjourney is that the different details you include in your prompt can override other details. So I prompted for a wide angle shot but because I added in the fact that she has tired eyes that tends to create close-up shots in Midjourney. So if you include details about the face, Midjourney almost always will zoom in a bit more and give you a close-up shot or a medium shot. Here's another example, one I did with no facial details for a wide angle shot. And in the other one, I added in some details about her facial expression. And you can see that if you include in the facial expressions, that tends to override the wide angle shot. Now to deal with this, you can use pan or zoom or the reframe features in Midjourney to add more to the outside borders of the photo and do the outpainting. I don't really like how the pan and zoom features work right now. I feel like they don't give you that much creativity or control as they used to for some reason, but that's a topic for another video. The overhead shot places you directly above the subject and points the camera down. It makes you feel more detached from the what's going on and gives you a more objective view of the environment. Now, like I said, the details you include can matter a lot. So in the surfer image on the right, I just asked for an overhead shot. But I, if I also included specific details about the person's face, it wouldn't produce this image. It would produce something that focused more on the head and torso of the person. 
One cool camera angle you can get now is over the shoulder shot where the camera is behind the shoulder of a subject. So in this case, it looks like a man is talking to a woman. We can see the man's face, but the camera is behind a woman's shoulder. Back in the day in mid-journey, this camera angle would never work, but now it seems to work pretty well if you include it inside the prompts. So we've talked about the direction the subject is facing, the framing of the subject in the camera shot, and the camera angle. To maximize your prompts in mid-journey and get the most dynamic looking photos, you want to mix and match between these three things. Here's a quick example. I did an ultra wide angle shot, a side profile shot so the person is facing us at a 90 degree angle from the side, and a low angle shot from below. And notice how I specifically included his hat and also his boots inside of the prompt so we can get the entire body. And this is a much more dynamic shot than the other photos we've taken so far. In this example, I replaced the side profile shot to a back view shot from behind. It doesn't actually include the person's feet inside the image, although I did prompt for her to be wearing black boots. Um, sometimes in mid journey, there's specific subjects or prompts that just don't work with certain types of camera angles. And so I'll probably have to change up this prompt a bit more to include the actual full body. Now let's take another photo from above the subject of the full body. I also included the type of camera lens. So here I used extreme fisheye lens, which we'll discuss in the next section. But I do like this photo. It's kind of like we're looking at her from a security camera and she's just staring at us. As far as prompting is concerned, the camera lens is like a filter that you put on top of the photo. So for example, we could go with cracked camera lens that gives you this shattered glass effect on top of the image. Fisheye lens are extremely, extremely wide angle lens that create this distorted spherical effect. You can sometimes also get this if you prompt for a really, really wide aspect ratio. If you've ever seen a GoPro video, this is kind of what it would look like. And if you want highly, highly detailed images, you can try macro lens photography. Macro lens are specifically designed for close-up shots of small subjects like insects. And if we look at the butterfly image, you can see so much texture, even all the individual furs on its body. Tilt shift lens produced this miniature world effect. So this is most obvious in the image of the landscape in the middle where all the buildings look like little toy houses. This works really well for cityscapes or landscapes. I find it doesn't work as well for animals or human subjects or anything like that. We've already talked about cracked camera lens. You could also use scratched camera lens to get the similar effect. I wasn't sure where to put selfies Looking back now, I probably should have put this together with the camera shots, but everybody knows about these. Um, you can combine selfies with any type of subjects, even historical ones, and you can see their arms reaching out in some of them to take the photo. Here's another example of a selfie of Joan of Arc. Let's talk a little bit more about framing techniques. So you can think of your photo as a frame, but inside that frame, you can create a smaller frame for the focus of the image. In this example, you can see that the girl is looking at us inside of a small opening in a cubicle. This technique helps make your images feel a lot more immersive. In the image on the left, it feels like you're on a pirate ship yourself looking at the other ships in the ocean through a telescope. And in the photo on the right, if it was just a plain bird's eye view photo of a volcano, it wouldn't really feel like you're there. But because we're seeing it through an airplane window, it's almost like you're experiencing it for yourself. Depending on how you use this technique, you can create coziness or a feeling of claustrophobia. Typically, if you use circular and round shapes that create softer looking images. All the camera angles and shots I've described so far also apply to landscapes or really anything else you can think of. In this example, I gave a bird's eye view of a steam train. You can think of this kind of like an overhead shot. The satellite shot will pull the camera back even further and get even higher in the air. Or you can go all the way down to the ground and take a ground level shot where the camera is literally placed on the ground and taking a photograph, which is a pretty cool camera angle that we don't really get to see. Think of it like if you were crawling on the ground and looking around. Low angle shots also work to make things look larger and more imposing and more majestic. Or you can take a, a bird's eye view, go above and uh, get a different perspective. The opposite of the overhead shot would be one where you're pointing the camera directly upwards. I found that this didn't work well for most prompts. 
a lot of the times it just gave you a low angle shot instead of pointing it directly upwards. But in this photograph of leaves falling, it did turn out pretty well. Again, like I mentioned previously, for more cinematic photos like a panoramic shot, you can use a super super wide aspect ratio. Here I went all the way to 3 to 1. If you go too far with it, like 4 to 1 or 5 to 1, Midjourney can give you some weird looking photos though. So in summary, we covered the direction that the subject is facing, how to frame that subject inside a camera shot, the angle that we're looking at them from, the type of camera lens that we're using to shoot the photo, how to use the framing frame technique, and finally, camera angles for landscapes. I have a glossary of keywords here. I won't cover all of them. I will include an ebook uh, in the description, so you can go get that if you're interested. Also, make sure to go and check out this video if you want to learn more about cinematic prompting in mid-journey.